Um, as always, you are my inspiration. And I didn't realize you've been to Guantanamo and you are the, I must have known because you're the inner voice in me uh, that led us to create a project on Guantanamo. So we now have 100 hours, um, mostly with uh, advocates, lawyers, people who resign from the military and protest. But now we're interviewing families and people who were held there. And in fact, I'm going tonight to CUNY Grad Center where Gareth Pierce is presenting oh. on her work with, with former prisoners in Britain and the families are coming. So again, you've been the inspiration, the light that led me to even imagine that this is what we have to do next. And you are, both of you, to me, the embodiment of something we write about in oral mm -hmm. history and probably in other genres of testimony, which is the role of the witness and the power of the witness. And I think we see here today the incredible power of individuals that this is, that, it, that can transform, that can come up against massive institutions, the flattening of, of narrative from the mass media and refuse to be, not only refuse to be silenced, but create a new way of us thinking and imagining a world in which we can act, not just respond to atrocity. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, just thank you both. Yes, thank you. And thank you all. So we have some time um, now that you could, uh, those of you who would like to can, we'll maybe we'll end a little early around 3.15, but we have some time that those of you who are motivated or interested could actually participate and ask some questions yourselves um, if you would like to, or make some responses. Yes, Marianne? Yeah, um, well, I had a very supportive program at Hunter, and it was actually through Asian American Studies, but they were concerned and uh, about my safety. They said it wasn't so much what I would do, but my uh, just in case students had an angry response, maybe it's best for you to stay home, which was unnecessary. I mean, that class had the most media coverage. We had radio in the classroom. We had um, we had a documentary film. Uh, to, what divided they fall by um, Valerie Kaur. I mean, it was most of my students from that class. And um, I mean, it, it was an. Un, I mean, I understand where they were coming from, but at the same time, it was a little unnecessary too. But. I mean, as you can tell, I mean, it's very hard for me to, um, I'm so emotional, so I think in one way it was, it was okay, because I'd probably just come in and just start crying, but, um, but it turned into a very warm class, and since it was the first class I had taught, it affected my, um, my role as a teacher, it affected my pedagogy, so I, I always bring in, and I, Judith Butler, who talks about moments of catastrophe as being that place where you create empathy and connect rather than create war, right? That really appealed to me. And uh, I think it really affected my work and, um, and my, my teaching method. So, thank you. There's a question back there. thought I was using my teacher voice, uh, <laughs> using, uh, um, he was encountered because of his religion. Now my question to both of you, well, in spite of all that you experienced, 
was speaking to Zora, your encounter with your father's um, um, explanation of the interview due to his geographic ancestry or was it related to his religious affiliation? And the same to you. Um, that's a good question. It actually was very complex for my dad because, um, uh, yes, of course, his name is Abdul, so that's clearly you know, very Muslim for him. Uh, he works at a dental lab. My dad was a, uh, a dentist, and my family were like the first dentists in Afghanistan. So he, ha you know, he comes from a different place. So when he was targeted for the first time, he's like, "These are dentists who are attacking," and these are dentists being racist towards him. And he was like, "Wait." We talk about teeth, but no, no teeth. We're going <laughs> to talk about where Osama bin Laden is. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but the interesting thing was that it had to do with Afghanistan and the Soviets because it was uh, one person was a Russian American who said it would have been better if we had stayed in Afghanistan, which was really like layers of complexity and racism, right? Another was. Um, someone who was from Uzbekistan, and my family originally, originally is from Uzbekistan, and he was trying to, they were very um, sort of like, I don't know, it's a Soviet era Uzbekistan tactics of uh, uh, saying a person was a nationalist, it was the same as calling a person a Muslim terrorist after 9-11, right? So he was using, he had a history of uh, he was threatening my dad by saying that catching Uzbek nationalists, and he was going to catch my dad that way too, as a Muslim terrorist. So the 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 historical layers of this racism was very very complex, which goes beyond oh you're brown, we're racist against you. There's something, you know, deeper I think, or not deeper, just a longer history. So it's very interesting with Salman with us, I don't think it was at all uh, uh, geographical at all because he grew up here. Uh, it was political. Uh, it was the NYPD who sent out the flyer and look what's happening, what news is coming out about the NYPD breaking all those surveillance rules and violation, you know, violating the federal rights, civil liberties. There are cases now being filed against them. And so it was not geographical at all. It was religious based, definitely. Any other any other questions or comments? Yes, Anne. Oh, oh sorry. Well, somebody else has. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was very interesting for me to hear both of you, um, having read your interviews in print and then seeing you live here for the first time. And um, despite the fact that you both have. Um, have been public people, and um, Talat Hamdani spoke a lot about becoming a public person, so you've had ways to craft your stories for um, different public audiences. I did also appreciate the, I, I feel a certain protectiveness. It was difficult even for me to be an audience member and, and then to watch the questions unfold in the places where um, it was nice to have both Mary Marshall and Jerry say, if you don't want to answer the question, you don't have to. So this was, I think, a different kind of performance of interview than in other places. But um, Zora, I particularly wanted to ask you about this, having read some of the interviews you did. And one of the um, themes that I saw there were a lot of people, yourself included, um, talking about being asked to sort of perform um, Afghan and Afghan American identities in the wake of 9-11 uh, and uh, and also I think there's a particular place in the public for the family members um, of 9-11 um, of victims um, and so I just I want to ask you for your thoughts about what your ideal interview is or what what makes for a bad um, situation where you're being asked to testify or tell your story and what would be better ways in which people's 
personal and individual stories could be told, especially in media circumstances, because I think the oral history interview is a very particular, uh, very intimate one, especially because of the long form. But it strikes me that one of the stakes of, that oral, of the 9-11 oral history project at Columbia is also to intervene in the ways in which often media interviews are very superficial in the way that they use people's stories. And I wonder how each of you have tried to negotiate that in order to be able to tell your stories in the way that you want them to be heard. Well, I'll just start with a really funny story. I was, um, well, I think that when you're a writer in New York, everyone thinks that if they promise you this possibility of maybe somewhere being published, like they'll, they, they got you, you know you'll do anything they want. So I had, I'd been asked, I was introduced to all these wonderful writing possibilities and writers and very famous ones now, um, and then pulled back and said, well, if you can be our Afghan woman, being an Afghan woman isn't being me, right? It means being um, you know, in a burqa and have, be willing to have that burqa pulled off by Oprah or anyone else. And um, <laughs> it means um, talking about the story of um, the typical refugee story. And I didn't have that story. I mean, I joke and say I'm a refugee from one air conditioned place to another because I was really lucky. I mean, I was in Saudi Arabia. It wasn't really that bad. So, I mean, I was lucky. I had, you know, family go through much more difficult things. And I'm very grateful for, for that. But when there's a there's, when you bring community and you interview people and you could talk and write about them, that's something else. When you're asked to be the Afghan woman, then it's really um, offensive. So I did what any Brooklyn girl would do. I, um, I mass emailed every single person, <laughs> this person who invited me knew, and I just said, I will not be da 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 da. Thank you for your offer of XYZ, but I will not be taking it. But, you know, Canadian BBC, can, can, wait, no, it's not BBC. They wouldn't be Canadian. CBC, which was a weird, really strange place because it's progressive and you're very excited about being on it. When we did something with the Afghan American anthology, they invited us to be on. Me and my friend Sahad Maradi co edited this anthology. And they asked us to be on. But when we read our poems, because we didn't have accents, they decided to take um, uh, South Asian uh, women with accents, and I think one was Arab, uh, Arab descent, to be our voices. So hearing the story of growing up in Brooklyn from, I don't know, much older, it was just very weird. So, and then uh, to package that as a CD to sell with a picture of a dirty little Afghan kid, poor kid, but I mean, but. It was, that's what they were selling. And we got our lawyers after them. We were like, no, you can't process this. And then have our Zora Saeed be, you know, um, like, I don't know, my aunt or something. Not even from the right continent or geographic space. But, mm -hmm. but that, those things were very uh, frustrating, but funny. Good stories to tell, I think. Well, I gave numerous interviews, you know, since last year for this, you know, 10th anniversary and uh, uh, name it, you know, all the channels, you know, even National Geographic and Frontline, everybody. But where I stand right now, I do not want to talk about that day at all because it pushes me back. It's not good for my mental health, pushes me in depression. Yes, but that is a, it has given me a, a cause, a passion to fight for you know, fight for justice. And I look forward uh, to how I can, you know, achieve, you know, be more effective in uh, trying to restore the rule of law and more importantly, uh, this suspicion and scapegoating, the McCarthyism type of a environment that has been created by uh, some politicians, you know, uh, I will definitely be more involved with that and uh, moving forward, try to uh, pull away. You know, it'll be a long struggle, but piece by piece, little by little, we should be able to, uh, you know, break down the, the phobia that has been created against all the Muslims. You know, so that's where I see myself. And what what I experienced ten years ago uh, is not fabricated. You know, it is hard document. I mean. When Peter King's testified, when Keith Ellison testified, uh, 
Fox 5, they try to deny because Fox 5 is the parent company of New York Post, but the Post had the article, you know, missing or hiding. Yes, every, we went to Mecca to pray, you know, in, in October 11th because uh, we didn't know where Salman was. So they all came to my house and I said, what brings you back to the house? And they told us there's a flash of the clating. So everybody else, the, the New York Daily News, the Newsday and Times, they wrote very factual, you know, the family has gone to pray and hopefully, you know, they'll be, they're emotionally, they'll, they need healing. But Post wrote, you know, missing or hiding. And then he was seen at 11 a.m. at Midtown Tunnel. He left home with the Quran in his hand that day. <laughs> Seriously, I had that article. And uh, people are saying, you know, he's not to be found at the rubble, but, you know, he has police ID. And that's what the flyer said. Uh, wanted, hold and detain. Uh, has police ID, chemistry major. So, you know, I experienced it, and it was my child. There was no way I'm not going to speak up. And now it's coming down to a whole community. It's not only simply religious, it is religious, it is race-based, you know, Arab race, religious, and ethnicity, so it's very complex. And it will take decades to, you know, restore. And uh, like yesterday, you know, <laughs> I was a substitute teacher, and one kid goes, yes, Talat is the secret wife of Osama bin Laden. I said, yeah, Jerry, you know his name is Jerry, too, sorry. So, <laughs> so he, I said, there's a secret only the family knew. <laughs> 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 so, that, so, I mean, I face it, you know. I, it, it, it's still there. And these are kids who are 14, 15 now, so they were four, five, when 9 11 happened. So, where are they getting this information from? It is inducted by the media. And, you know, I mean, like Murdoch and Peter King, if they're not happy, they don't belong in America. Go back to Ireland and go back to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one last question, I think. Yes. Or two. <laughs> <laughs> Tina's going to be bypassed again. <laughs> no. You touched on it um, in both of your just your class, last comments, and this is a follow-up to Anne's question, which is that um, what I'm struck by is the fact that memory is work, right? Memory is not just about recounting uh, something that happened, but it's work. And in terms of the work that you're doing for us and the work that your interviewers have done, I'm wondering if you notice, having told your stories over and over again, any differences in telling it over time. So from that point in 2001 to this point, um, and I'm actually, I would love to hear from um, Mary Marshall and Jerry as well about um, what do you hear that changes or that doesn't change? And when you're telling your stories, what changes do you experience in doing this kind of memory work with us? Great question. For me, uh, it's that it changes. It is a growing process and the dynamics of our country is changing. So, and like I said, it changes and I feel myself, you know, and then the last one year, a lot of healing process has taken place, a lot of uh, awareness, I've become a lot aware of, of many different issues and the complexities. Uh, so it changes with time and uh, every three months, I think there are events happening or maybe I'm educating myself, but it does change. And I, sometimes I speak to it, I give interviews and it was from different perspective, depending on what they wanted to ask. So uh, yes, it may, you have to not change the story, but it depends what the interviewer wanted to question. Like the Japanese were very interested in uh, the <clears throat> discrimination and their similarities to the Second World War, post-American Second World War issues. Uh, and uh, National Geographic just did on Salman, and how he grew up, everything. Uh, so yes, it, I, I, I feel a change in me every, every two or three months, you know, because of what's happening in our political uh, uh, spectrum across the country, I think, you know. And people say I've become a political, I've become a politician. No, I'm not a politician, it's just that 
that this issue is so so close to my heart that you know it's 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 not a political issue for me it's a cause for me it's a mission and uh, that's how i feel, you know it's very different for me um for me i think it's different genres of telling uh one telling it in a more humorous way. A lot of the uh, material that we're publishing upset press is the independent press. So it's, it's all about community work for me, bringing multiple voices, whether it's anthologies, collaborative performances and art things, um, or publishing other writers. It's been trying to bring a little humor and um, maintaining the dark moments, not shying away from it, but uh, kind of a dark humor has has grown amongst the generation, my generation, who's sort of grown up here and articulate. So it's kind of interesting to see articulate in writing or in uh, film or in um, absurdist video art or whatever it is, right? So one project has been to tell it differently or tell it askew, right? Um, the other way for me personally to tell it is uh, poetry is a different thing it's not necessarily from a liter literate place for me. It's from music and rhythm and images and, you know, it's a different way of telling and performing and voice and breath. Um, and then telling it this way, I've, I've, I always feel very awkward. But, um, and then t writing it academically and writing it, um, you know, as an intro for a textbook. I mean, it's, it's really different genres of telling. And I don't think any way is, is an easy way, right? So. Um, in terms of listening, um, I think it's a mark of, well, I've been watching Zora for 10 years, so <laughs> that's a long time in her, at her age in life now. And um, in the beginning, it, the stories uh, were so haunting, and there still are, of course. Um, and there were so many things we talked about extra to the interview in private spaces about families, about brokenness, about fear. I could see the fear, I could see the guilt. And today when we met, we've been in touch, I guess not for the last couple of years. And today when we met for lunch, we exchanged uh, ideas about juices we should be drinking to improve our immune systems. And she's teaching me, you know, because she's farther advanced than I am. And there's a way in which there is an increased lightness. There's a way in which um, both of these incredible women have pushed back against the silence and really broken it because they're trying to educate audiences to listen. The plight of, of people who are perceived as, in the global way, as terrorists, whether Arab Americans, Muslims, Sikhs, whomever it may be in this country, has not really changed or diminished. But the voices that we hear today on the stage have grown stronger and stronger. And it gives you, the audience, the right to speak up for them and with them and to learn about healthy things to eat and drink. <laughs> I would just add that um, this, this whole process, I mean, it's all about the process. And so the past is a kind of country that we visit di from you know, a different vantage point and in different ways on different days. And uh, yet there are some things that remain the same. But what I've noticed and what seems to have changed in your story um, is that you seem stronger. And at the same time, still determined to tell. And people do feel protective and, um, and I feel protective and I don't want to make any kind of spectacle of anybody's grief. But it's a difficult story and it is your choice and because we have given you this opportunity um, and you've chosen to take it, and we have said you are driving this interview, and we mean it. Um, I, I really admire your ability. And to balance, too, grief and humor. Mm -hmm. I mean, you started with humor, uh, humorous stories about the past. People know a lot about storytelling and what they're doing, and we need to give them credit for what they know as storytellers. And, uh, and what it sort of stirs up in me, and I think is important that it stirs up in any oral history interviewer, is my own memories, because I'm asking you questions based on empathy, based on my, uh, you know, what information I have and my own intuition that you sort of spark um, through your humanity. Yeah. I think that's a nice place to close.
And please be back at 3.45 because the um, conversation will be enlarged to include a performance of uh, some of the stories that were collected after September 11th. Thank you.